Good evening. Um, I'm Natasha Sandmeyer. I'm just uh, going to introduce Alec tonight. Um, it's a pleasure, to actually, to welcome him back, him and Sadie back, um, former intermediate unit masters. Um, Alex was a unit master at the AA from 1995 to 2002, um, which is about when I met him, um, in, a focus, in a unit that focused on, um, as most of you probably know, material systems, building components, and product catalog design, um, and the influence of those things on design thinking. And if you know anything about Alex and the office, you know that they really also practice what they preach. And so it's a really interesting symbiosis and, and linkage between what they taught in the unit and actually how they, how they operate in the office. Um, I first met Alex here in my first year teaching and unfortunately his last year teaching. They promised they were just leaving on a one year sabbatical and uh, proceeded to get so busy they really haven't come back since other than for sporadic but fun um, reappearances and lectures and exhibitions. Um, it's a great, really a great pleasure to welcome him back tonight and for a presentation of some of their more recent work. Since leaving the AA, um, as a unit master, Alex and Sadie's office, DRMM, established with uh, Philip Marsh, has gone on to become one of the most important and still young offices um, in the UK today. And their buildings, as you may know, have won many, many design awards in recent years. Um, tonight's talk, titled Naked House, is taken from a recent in installation that they did um, in Oslo in Norway uh, last summer, a project for a one-to-one -one house prototype installation um, constructed and assembled quite literally from a single material. Um, DRMM's multi-year research in high-tech engineered timber products have all explored what Sadie and Alex have called naked construction. Um, it's a form of building design, assembly, structure, and making, all of which together expose the materiality, which is really what the practice is quite critical about, of a structure's production. Um, in the end, it's an architectural agenda that relies on inventive, incredibly creative, exploration into some of the most advanced kinds of building products and materials available today, and ironically, most of those are wood. Um, a system most architects, or a kind of material system most architects think of as traditional, conventional base, and some may even say quite boring. Um, but as Alex has written in the events list blurb tonight, timber is the new concrete. DRMM has developed innovative education sector design product projects in recent years, including their very well-known Kingsdale School, in South London, which was finished in 2004. Um, it features an early DRMM experimentation with ETFE, uh, variable skin technology. He's lectured internationally on the work of the firm and has been published worldwide, and most recently was with us as an external examiner in the AA for the past two years. Please join me in welcoming Alex Dereike. Thank you, Natasha. Um, that was so succinct, it seems unnecessary for me to speak at all. Um, however, I've got far too many images to um, not speak at, so I'll proceed. Um, when we started DRMM, it was with a project which tried to uh, capitalize on a couple of themes, recycling and the idea of standardization. And I want to show the work tonight more or less entirely within those terms, although there are many other issues that run throughout the work. Um, I'll show Naked House, but at the end and in the context of um, previous projects, and I hope you'll bear with me because there is um, a lot to get through, so I'll go through quickly. And um, I guess try and make, um, uh, or try and justify the, the comment that timber is the new concrete, which sounds throwaway, but for me it's, um, it's taken 10 years to come to that conclusion. This, by the way, was called Floating House, and it was just about uh, reusing obsolete Thames barges as um, housing for London, cheap housing, which could, when grouped, form communities, bridges, uh, floating islands, floating gardens, swimming pools, and bars, and so on. Um, that was in the days when we were still looking at um, steel structures as the obvious uh, route into prefabrication, but um, tonight really is about trying to define a shift in that. Um, the AA was a great period f for me in particular because I, I had, to, um, had to define what we were trying to do, and it was really about um, trying to produce 
special architecture out of very ordinary elements and constraints. And I've always been fascinated by that. Not just um, a fascination with the everyday and the ordinary per se, but uh, w you know, what you can do with it, I mean, how you can manipulate it. And I guess uh, making non-standard architecture from standard components became a, a bit of a mantra, really, for the unit and um, subsequently for our work. Uh, we had a show here which, in which we, tr we tried to sort of make sense or, or make a catalogue of our own work and, and that was really crucial because it, it became obvious that every single project was characterised by a particular investigation into one, sometimes two, materials. But generally projects um, are very, you know, very much about pushing one particular component or element to, to, tr to try and get the maximum expression from that. So the, the system here, which was an exhibition about defining space with these projects, so they, you know, the visitor goers could move it around and make, make sense of the space as they look through the project. I mean, the one on show is the um, Architects Registration Board office, which is really just about trying to use Italian polycarbonate roofing as walling and trying to define um, spaces which were supposed to be both um, private and discreet, but also um, accessible and much more um, about the board being accountable and visible. We also dallied with fiberglass, not long. Um, fascinating material, but in sustainability terms, it's really hard to justify, especially when you wrap it around an aluminium grid. But it was f fun to do, fun to hang a structure from a pre-existing structure. There was a failed pavilion in the square in Brighton, town square, Bartholomew Square, right opposite the town hall, and we'd um, we stripped it back to the structure and then superimposed and, and draped uh, a timber and fiberglass structure from it. We also looked at um, the idea of pods, which was something that was um, also being explored at the AA at the time. Uh, there was a capsule hotel project here, and we were looking at um, a bigger scale of student accommodation for the Royal College of Art um, together with the Peabody Trust. This is supposed to be a new sculpture workshop studio with student housing above. And the idea here was to make fiberglass um, pods which were not whole units. This was a, a loose fit. This was a tolerance fit between an in situ concrete waffle and prefabricated kitchen and bathroom pods. They were like suitcases that could open up and therefore um, not only define the individual spaces but define the expression of the facade according to where they were placed. Um, they obviously had to be against a party wall in order to get the services running down, but other than that they could be articulated by being pushed in, pushed out, and being one side or the other, being different colours. And th I think that project, um, you know, which was one of the many competitions that we, we've done, um, served to develop thinking in the office. I think that's a fantastic thing about doing competitions. It's not just unifying for the team, it's also about trying to define um, what it is you're trying to do. Um, our first, in fact, only commission, which um, came through a non-competition route, was um, through a failed student, a former student, who was so bad that um, I had to oblige him to leave. Not this school, it may interest you to know, but um, another one. And he had the best ideas, and it was difficult to fail him, but he never drew anything up. And um, interestingly, eight years later, he phoned up and said, I'm a developer now, and would you like to um, build this building for Roger Zagolovich and me? And so um, Giles Cherry inadvertently became the, the link to in situ concrete. And this phase was unexpected for us because our interest in systems and components and prefabrication didn't really ever invite us to look at in situ concrete, but Roger said that's your criteria. And so we did a building where the in situ concrete was board marked as an interior and overclad with prefabricated concrete, or if you prefer, uh, fibrous cement panels, very thin, very faux wood. Most people assume it's a timber building, but it's in fact um, a hybrid of in situ and prefabricated. 
and that's where we are, we're based now. One of the questions that was asked during, um, there, was, there was rather a, a lot of publicity for that building because it, it seemed to coincide with a lot of reassessment of housing at the time. And um, it, got, it got a ridiculous, an embarrassing amount of, war, of awards, um, he said disingenuously. <laughs> but um, one of the uh, criticisms that I really remembered because I think it's valid, was could you do this for social housing? And could you make um, something out of concrete architecture that would do something for the social sector? Which, to be honest, is uh, the preferred uh, area of work within the practice. We prefer to do public projects, if possible. And this competition for Southwark housing, uh, Southwark regeneration, basically, not so much Southwark housing as Southwark regeneration, Chris Horne's brainchild for the Elephant and Castle. There was a pilot project announced as a competition, and we, we decided to try and do um, the economic version of our own building that we'd bought into, and to try and do the same thing again, but you know, much more simply and effectively and cheaply. And the, the concept really was to make these C-shaped apartments um, some people would call it tetalus, but I think that's probably over the top. It's more like um, a collection of elements which, when grouped, form very compact and high-res system of interlocking blocks. It's like a sort of three-dimensional puzzle. Um, and they, they consist of either handed double height or two-story maisonettes um, sandwiched around smaller single-story units. Um, and following the building line and making cuts through it uh, gave a kind of continental access principle uh, which differs greatly from the uh, Haygate estate which it replaces. Um, again, it was a, a, a close scrutiny on construction that gives the project its quality and um, as opposed to the variegated facade principle that we developed for Central Street, which allows complete flexibility of the positioning of the uh, prefab concrete panels. On this, we just did it in a, a more kind of rural Norwegian style, where um, you have a vertical boarding superimposed over a plinth of concrete block. I mean, the trick with it was to somehow make a north-facing facade um, with bedrooms only, organized quite carefully to make use of the south aspect for living rooms on the other side. The trick was with this was to try and uh, resonate with the context, which currently um, on Wansley Street is Victorian housing at one end and the Edwardian Town Hall at the other end. And we, we literally tried to bridge in colour and scale between those two. It's a very direct response of taking the yellow stop brick at one end and then running it through four graduations in colour to the Edwardian brick colour at the other end. So it's like a sort of barcode approach which staggers in height according to the, um, the mass of the buildings. And this building is, is the first of many that Southern Regeneration are planning to replace the Haygate which will be demolished and redeveloped in phases. And we we're quite pleased with, pleased with this uh, effectively cheap as chips facade, which doesn't look, you know, you're not allowed to say cheap in, in these circles. You have to say uh, best value or economic or something like that. But we think it looks a million dollars, but actually it's, you know, like 18 pounds a metre. The south side is completely different by virtue of the fact that it is about a collective space and it's a, a communal garden fully glazed living rooms with solar glazed control that's individually operated from the unit. So everyone gets some private outdoor space, but there's also the collective space of the garden below. This is obviously before it's planted up. Right, the next project was about ETFE, and Natasha mentioned Kingsdale, which um, has been a long project. We're just approaching the conclusion now after winning the competition in 2000. Uh, it's been on site since 2004 in a, a very uh, extended series of phased operations that had to accommodate the school being there the whole time. The biggest move was really 
to make an enormous dry social space at the heart of the school, which previously was characterized by a kind of neglect. Um, and ETFE was, was, after a lot of study into other options and comparatives in terms of costing as well as uh, environmental performance, we decided on ETFE. Um, I mean the school is a paradox. It, it's a building that's, I mean, it, it's a modernist building in a, in a Victorian context predominantly. It's, it's a social sector education building in a private sector context. You know, public, um, what's in England called public school is of course private, but the, on the left you've got Dulwich Prep, which is one of the most well-known private schools, Dulwich College, and then Kingsdale, which is a completely different kettle of fish. It's rather Cartesian, rather abstract. It's a glass building which you can't see into. And it's really a black school in a white community. And there are many problems around behavior in the school. And the experiment that the Architecture Foundation dreamt up was to see whether there could be a corollary between design and education standards. You know, in other words, could good architecture improve students performance, you know, behavior, grades, all of it. So the existing building was the subject of a lot of scrutiny and um, consequently many options that were costed and put in front of the DFES who eventually agreed to um, fund our m master plan for the whole site, although albeit in phases. The ETFE roof really is the, the key to unlocking a dysfunctional modernist building which had 90 metre long corridors with no daylight, very institutionalised character, just numbers on doors, you know, and an unused central space that was effectively an uncool garden for the girls who didn't like it and uh, kind of kick around place for the boys. Um, so a bit of strategic demolition which involved actually demolishing the, the only good bit of this otherwise bad example of a Leslie Martin building. We had to persuade all and sundry that we had to take the good hall out and put a better hall in its place. And I think that's best defined by the quality of light that this particular material gives. And what we tried to do is progress from the sort of Eden position of a, a deliberate greenhouse into something which could vary light. And in discussion with Vector, Mike Haddy Associates with the engineers, Vector special projects of the ETFE specialists and Fulcrum, the environmental engineers, we developed um, what was called a variable skin roof, whereby over, say, a 20 minute period, this can happen. And that's just um, a rather clever superimposition of printing patterns onto the ETFE. It was controlled by that computer on the roof, which uh, delivers different air pressure to the different cushions according to the difference in air temperature across the roof. So it becomes very much a, a, a register, to use a Smithson expression, a register of the climate. And it's a very beautiful inside-out space, which is kind of, um, it's kind of inspiring, but it's also quite um, underplayed. You know, you feel like you're still outside. It's a kind of inside-out space. Um, we, I think it's probably fair to say that that's pr the last time we'll try and use steel. I mean, it's a 40-meter span, and it's, um, it's quite a, an amazing structure in the sense that it's in entirely superimposed over the existing minimal structure of the 1950s host school. So it's kind of right on the edge, really. The only, um, you see those columns on the left at the end of this bridge, they're not supporting, they're tying it down. I mean, it this is a very lightweight, I mean, it's, it, it's uh, I think it's, I, swear I don't think I'll try and remember the exact span to weight ratio, but believe me, it's out there. And the point is that steel is, um, is good at that, but since then and since doing this project with you and these site for the um, air extract ductwork, which I think is a pretty um, lateral contribution to make from an artist. Um, since that point, although we enjoyed it, we probably haven't used any steel s since then. And that brings us to the main theme of tonight, which is about different ways of manipulating timber in order to achieve different ends. I mean, I think this 
so-called deformed geodesic, um, which is, I guess, um, as much down to the invention of the specialist contractor Gordon Cowley as it is, say, us defining the geometry, or Hikaru, who is here tonight, defining the geometry, or, um, you know, Hadi's defining the overall performance of it, or, you know, the performance requirements of it. It's, um, it was a very interesting place to go. You know, Cowley's omnidirectional joints allow any geometry, and this allowed it to be a non-pure geodesic. And there's great freedom in that, so we're able to sort of sit it on the site and let it sag onto the floor and drape onto the circulation at first floor level. And it's interesting to use things timber like larch in the round with just these specialist joints that are glued internally, like uh, rather like putting a lead in a pencil. Um, yeah. It was a shame to clad it in a way, but the whole point of the thing was to make an acoustic, a timber building within the steel and glass and plastic building. And um, this is really the first time we used timber in a serious way, and we were trying to um, get around the programmatic issue of the lack of um, social space for students. And there were five houses defined. We couldn't afford five um, buildings within the building, so we said, let's just make one fantastic one and you use it a day a week each, each house. So the response was to make this um, quite private building within the building and a very, um, it's very much a first division sort of space, I think. Um, it's not the sort of space you expect to find in a school and it's, it's entirely for the students, you know, their question, uh, what is it during construction and oh right, we won't be allowed there, it is um, a sort of tragic response to the idea that if it's really special, they can't have it, but it's just for them, it's just for their meetings, films, um, you know, presentations, awards, performances, and so on. And this is the first day they, the first day they actually got to access it, so it was a very exciting point in the project. We tried to extrapolate, um, we tried to invert the diagram of the ring donut with a translucent center by making this so-called climatic envelope the entire school for a hypothetical research project for the government. Um, and this project, which we call the Jura, was about making completely prefabricated timber classrooms which can be uh, laid on a simple table of concrete and enclosed by an ETSE bubble. And the idea is that um, this table can be laid in a great many different ways, and it's up to the school to determine exactly how they want to develop. So you may start with a certain configuration which corresponds with pedagogic intent and the, the, the amount of departments and the kind of intake you have that year, but it's possible to vary it, and the very crane that assembled the thing remains in-house. It's a sort of tri-wire arrangement where the walls can simply be unscrewed and rearranged and classrooms can be added to or dismantled and changed. Um, we'd still very much like to build this project. We, we did it as a research project, but we think it's, um, it's perhaps the only exemplar that was commissioned that truly tries to address the question, what is the school of the future, you know, rather than a glorified mal, which seems to be the prototype for most secondary schools. And typolo typologically speaking, schools tend to be either a so-called street or mal model, which I unkindly call the glorified corridor, or they're the, um, in primary schools generally, they're the courtyard model, which is much more sympathetic, but nevertheless, those two typologies tend to be the ones always used, and they all have corridors, and this, the point about this one was that it was a kind of anti-corridor approach whereby the school could develop quite naturally around um, clusters and almost street-like patterns, or, you know, small community-type patterns. So, more on timber. Um, keeping us going with a variety of scales and projects has is, is always been important in the office and um, as we're not yet building the Jura, we're busy on a great many um, smaller projects which is a good way of developing and 
good way of, I think, in a way, it's a bit like competitions. You have to um, keep light on your feet, keep changing. And the, um, it's a bit like studying and a bit like traveling, I think, doing small interior projects at the same time as larger projects, at the same time as looking and thinking is incredibly important. And that I feel that that's what we've been doing in the office over the last kind of year, really. Um, for me personally, I mean, Japanese architecture is, of course, stunning in its in its ability to take um, not just local tradition, but um, themes about repetition and variation and prefabrication and renewal and sustainability. All of, all of these things are just built in, um, but it's built into a frame structure. And um, I think by the time we got to um, the Polish Czech mountains, the Tatra mountains, um, the idea of frame was, <laughs> to me, um, it had gone too far and it just got too, um, too reliant on what you put between the frames. And that we started to doing a, uh, an interesting frame building that's currently on site, so I won't show you any more than this, but it, I think this is a very interesting frame building, but I just know that we're not likely to continue down the frame route because we've got a taste of something else now, which Naked House exemplifies. So this house doesn't move around, but part of the house does. This is the house where the roof moves in order to liberate um, a certain set of uh, transparencies and voids and change relations. Uh, I'll show you that one later when it's done. It's just gone on site really recently. Um, and I think it's, m it's more interesting when timber starts becoming continuous rather than framed. I'm sort of more interested in it when it becomes um, mass, however that's achieved. And um, some interesting visits to factories have convinced me that um, the reason that timber is the new concrete is because it, of the continuity that's now possible with timber. And, and also because um, the sort of tradition of craft-based activities, uh, as in editing, is now um, something that is sort of built into the production of engineered timber. And the system that we've been looking at is, is KLH, cross-laminated holts. Um, and the examples that we saw like this um, struck me as being really kind of liberating in some respects, but also um, I was also a bit surprised that they seem to be, um, uh, it's early days, I know, but they, the system seems to be used for making sort of classically modern buildings that could have been done in another material. It's just like a, a substitution of the material rather than pushing that particular material in terms of its own characteristics. So you see, typically you see apartment blocks which um, could be in any material, you're not quite sure, but it is KLH or it is load-bearing timber underneath. And we were interested, especially after going to the factory, in trying to do work which really revealed the thing itself in all its glory and, and didn't try and cover it up or hide it or use it in um, sort of uh, knee-jerk or automatic ways. Um, and we found the visit particularly interesting because it, it makes you realize that um, there is such a direct transfer between the way in which we work as architects, you know, making models, for example. You know, you just make buildings in exactly the same way now as you make models. So um, if you're kind of clever about your models, you're doing them as laser cut models in CAD and you're doing a CAD drawing which is then simply passed on to a laser cutter. And in the case of the KLH factory, they have this absolutely fantastic CNC router where the basic panel width of three meters um, can continue up to, I'm told, 65 meters if you can move it. And um, any, any shape you like can simply be cut into it with this three axis router. And the waste can be used too. So I you know, like this sort of cycle of you know, planting, uh, cutting, planting twice as much as you cut, then making something, then using the waste in order to make um, wood fiber insulation to, co to clad the stru structure that you've put up. 
We've got a little bit of work in Norway at the moment. It's my favourite building in Norway. Um, because it's, it's just such a direct expression of what it's doing. You know, it has a boat house made of wood, you know, about as little as you could do, and yet still a very expressive building. We're trying to do um, high-rise timber, projects currently in planning, um, where it's a hybrid approach with a combination of a kind of tree core of concrete which allows cantilevered living in timber off it. And this is early days yet, but nevertheless for us, uh, I think a significant project for a couple of years to come. Now, I'm going to rattle through music and sport in order to show the more direct context for Naked House and then get on with it and finish. This is um, a project which was the final phase of Kingsdale School. Uh, the departments of music and sport were always the strongest and therefore not given early funding. And uh, the gamble that the head took on putting them, putting music and sport into the background of no funding and realizing the big moves first with the uh, transformation of the, of the main building was a very clever move because I guess he anticipated that it would be spectacular enough to generate more funding for the final phases. And this is exactly what happened. The DFES awarded it as a kind of precursor for the um, so-called early wins of the Building Schools of the Future program. And this is the site. It's the eastern boundary, which currently is pretty under, or was underused. There's uh, a sort of dysfunctional route up to a lock gate. Um, nice trees. The idea that you're kind of caged in and it's all about separation rather than uh, entry. There's um, a context of um, small social housing to the right of that image and then on the left, larger between the war blocks. This is the side of the site which is not about privilege. This is the uh, the side that we chose because we wanted to try and draw the community into the estate of Kingsdale because although they never had money, they had land. They're kind of inverse of the private sector adjacent who have loads of money and no land. We thought we'd make a gatehouse type whereby the two disciplines of sport and music were seen as one structure that formed a new entry to the whole site. Uh, I've got... Um, Fantastic pointer somewhere. No. Never mind. The, um, well, suffice it to say that we are trying to work with the idea of the route to the main building from the estate, uh, accommodating the trees and not um, ignoring the previous previous music block here and the previous sport block there, which are due to be recycled. Thanks. Due to be recycled themselves, hopefully by us, at another stage. So um, there we are. That's the, the kind of master plan. We're just finishing these. The, this is complete in its refurb, and uh, that includes a lot of services upgrading as well as the large move of the central space, and there's an awful lot of very carefully redesigned classrooms and accommodation in the main building, but that's more or less complete now. This is just about finishing on site and that's to come. The open air footy with um, running track. When, um, when the DFES give um, money for sports buildings, they call for a, a rectangle um, to service um, or to accommodate a specific number of badminton courts. That's the way they scale them and we went for a four bad court with um, a kind of ambition, a twofold ambition architecturally. We wanted to do a really simple building that was um, effectively answering the brief to do a box of the right size, the right footprint, but at the same time we wanted it to be much more than a box spatially, something really um, powerful spatially, and we wanted to use the cross-laminated Holtz system in a way which they hadn't used it before. In other words, uh, large span, single volume, and uh, above all, a warped form to achieve curvature in um, a flat panel system. So that was in the ambition for that building. With the music block, 
we wanted to provide a set of irregular rooms. I mean, the requirement for classrooms makes it differ fundamentally from the single volume of the sports. So that those rooms, we thought, would be defined by their irregularity, their, their spatial qualities, but also by the fact that they needed conventional windows, unlike the sports hall. But you're not allowed to open them because of sound issues. It had to be a um, mechanical vent building, not air con, but um, just air supply and extract. So that meant sealed windows, which brought us back to the two principles of the um, process of manufacture, that of um, a flat panel construction and that of perforation through routing, CNC cutting. The upper floors are um, uh, void to the sports hall. The building within the building, again, is, of course, the changing, changing facilities and a bit of spectator viewing, a lot of storage required for the main space, some offices, uh, a, a shared stairwell and lift and entrance between the two buildings, which picks up on this ramped route that we've established between the community here and, and the rest of the site. On the upper level, this becomes uh, a kind of mezzanine for dance and for spectators overlooking the action in the main very large space, it's about 20 by 80, and that's um, th the top part of a series of rooms which unfold around the plan, and uh, because of the geometry, we have a sort of one and a half height classroom that is a, a performance classroom. So we're able to experiment as I said, with two approaches. One, to make um, a planar building do, do a walked form, and one to make um, uh, an otherwise ordinary box, albeit a little bit irregular geometry-wise, um, to make it extraordinary because of the, uh, the type of perforation. Um, my only regret, actually, because I, I think this is a fantastic roof and I, I really love it, my only regret is that we weren't able to make it um, a skate park at the same time, so that all the program has to be inside the box as opposed to on it. And I think they're they're an interesting pair. You know, the the lightweight, transparent, and then relatively heavyweight, opaque, but both doing what they do best. I think. So that's under construction. Um, you can see the, the whole panel defined here, which these are sized um, not 65 meters long, but 16 and a half in order to fit onto an articulated lorry. And the whole, the whole building was delivered on a series of lorries and assembled extremely quickly. It was uh, a joy to watch that progress. This is, of course, a hybrid. The, the normal load-bearing wall system here is coupled with glue lamp beams, which um, the load of which the roof load is picked up on piers that engage with this wall, so it's it's more like a hybrid compared to, say, the music box, which is simply a perforated skin that is load bearing. Well, what we are trying to do when we are designing this was really just use one material and do as much as we could with it. So things like the stair, the lift, lift housing, not the lift itself, <laughs> but the tower of the lift and the, the bridges, various bridges between, for example, this castle building and the fire escape or the bridge between this building and the next building. All of these elements are made in the same material. And that's it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this will be published shortly. The handover is due at the end of this week. The music building was, I guess, um, our opportunity to try and fill a building with animation without actually manipulating the plan too much. So all of the joy comes in the light and the views and the shapes that define them. Um, and I guess this was important for us because we were not allowed to um, treat the exterior in the way in which we would have liked to have. We would like to have used timber as well, and we've ended up using, having to use steel 
for insurance reasons. But there was a kind of silver lining to that. So this sort of um, so-called mock timber cladding we've also used as the um, formwork for the concrete. So the building has a kind of protective concrete plinth at ground level above which is superimposed the um, insulation obviously and the cladding itself. And we're happy about the reference not only to the process of making but also to the idea that um, we did these because uh, Zurich would not allow us to do it in timber. And that's um, pretty much it. I want to get on to Naked House. I guess this last one shows a kind of key move of the relation of the aperture and the program inside because we asked KLH to deliver the offcuts, which they, they did. And we've, um, as an office, our contribution to the project was to recycle those offcuts into um, benches, which we've, we've donated to the school as our kind of gift to the project. It's, that's um, something I, I heard Ted Cullingham say that their office did a, a long time ago. And it struck me then that it was a really clever move in many ways. You have to make something. And you have to, um, in a way, think about the level of uh, intervention. In our own office, the uh, everything is revealed. You know, it's just straightforward um, DIY writ large, and it's very evident that kind of we've made it all ourselves, and it all comes from catalogues, and it's all about um, being able to um, be surrounded by your own experiment, really. Um, and when I started thinking about um, what the market was for, um, you know, relatively low-cost prefabricated housing, you don't have to look that far. I mean, um, not many people are doing flat pack as yet. And obviously, IKEA get the most press um, and have the most influence. But nevertheless, you know, it's not really a, a product which does it for me. I, I, um, I struggle to, s to see it picking up big time in this country, although I could be proved wrong. It may be that because it's cheap enough, it will be, uh, it will be bought. But it's, um, it's an attempt really here, by that this is of earlier this week, it's a, an attempt to respond to the criteria that I was trying to establish for us. Um, they previously made these as, you know, you had to have 16 or 8 units at a time. So that meant that someone else had to build it, in this case, um, Skanska. So there was a developer, and it, was, it wasn't about empowering individuals with prefabrication on an individual basis. This was about um, a kind of more collective social response, which clearly works better in Scandinavia than here. So I think part of them doing this and releasing this at the beginning of the week is because they want to address the, um, the market that wants to build its own. Um, and I guess you have to be clear about what you're not doing. And I, I didn't want it to be the IKEA route of encouraging car-based um, transport. And um, clearly lorries, you know, have to move them. And it's, um, it's not the only way. I mean, I, I was interested in a, a kind of universal system that could address rail and water. And obviously the ISO standard shipping container does it already. I mean, they are everywhere in the world that is, you know, remotely developed. You know, if there's a road or a waterway, even air routes, um, they can be accommodated with either 20 or 40 foot shipping containers. And I knew that this um, has also had a lot of attention in terms of, you know, people wanting to make houses out of containers. And uh, you can see some in London, for example, Nick Lacey has done uh, some artist studios in Docklands from them. But um, I, don't, I don't personally think they, they make great accommodation. They, I think they, they make great storage. And that's exactly what they're designed and engineered for. They're incredibly strong and incredibly precise, but um, as soon as you start cutting holes in them and trying to make them bigger, you know, wider than the, than the standard eight foot, um, they stop being a standard component within its limits, really. And they never start being a decent place to live because it's just a very hard steel box. Um, so the response, the criteria for the response were always um, sort of clear to us. 
and it, and it was that the thing had to be transported within the container, and then the container could be this kind of leg which supported the thing after it. So, um, uh, conceptually, it was thought of as um, uh, a kind of universal, universally distributable thing, which um, might be very different in each case, but it had to um, relate strongly to a container in as much as it should go inside it, and then you could use the container afterwards as a sort of garage or store or means of keeping it off the terrain. The, in terms of the timber, I was very interested in it being um, a continuous structure, and I wanted um, the panels to be end-to-end, -end so that, you know, you don't lift these personally. This is not about DIY, this is about craneage, and it's about very fast assemblies. And I thought, well, the bigger the better, you know if you could get the whole wall to be um, a beam and avoid um, panelizing the whole thing and if the floor could be continuous and the roof could be continuous so much the better so conceptually at least it was thought of as one material and as big as possible pieces so as few of them and early plans were um, inevitably personalized and I, I thought that's okay, you know, because I didn't really, there was no client, it was sort of a research thing. Um, so, Sadie, my family, myself, we thought of it as, um, we'll just treat it as um, a house for us, and that can be the, um, the basis on which it could be developed. We just try and tie down the criteria that way. But this early one shows um, an emerging plan which is just about really a shoebox with incisions in it. Uh, and they're routed cuts into an otherwise very regular kind of anti-form approach. Um, but I started having to think about moving and to think about all the crap that we take around with us everywhere and then just looking at it. I mean, this is somebody moving house and literally it's not enough to have a removals van. They needed that for it, etc. And when I was thinking about um, the whole of our life and could you possibly compress it into a, you know, something like 100 metres. It's actually very difficult. And I um, started wondering about, you know, could, it, could you have all your possessions or, um, and could you engage with the outside and the inside and could you have um, the kind of place that would accommodate the way you, you, you feel you live? Uh, could it be that and could it be um, really quite simple and minimal and not... Not minimal in the sense that I don't like minimalism, which is about, you know, it looks simple, but there's a host of steel and stuff behind it making this look simple. I like the idea that it's just simple all the way through. And um, uh, you can have your Subar photo. Of p you don't have to be in denial about it. You can have your plants. They don't have to be outside. Um, you can somehow try and integrate all the stuff that you need in life but architects choose to ignore really um, in terms of you know when you see plans they don't tend to be inclusive about what really is there you know like uh, for example the iron you, you don't ever see an ironing board on an architect's drawing but it's definitely in everyone's house and you know you've got to have your food and you've got to have your pavoni and your plates from Norway because you like them and you know you, you need your wine cellar and your Whatever, whatever turns you on, you know. It's, I think every single naked house is going to be different from that point of view. And I did this inventory of the contents of the flat, and then Junko and I in the office looked at these objects and decided whether or not they were necessary enough to be kind of cut out of the fabric of the structure itself. So Satoshi's stool prototype is um, sadly going to have to go back to Satoshi because I can cut that from the wall itself. And things like books can go in, and you know, Zadie may have to think about um, rationalising that wardrobe. It's um, it's just a an exercise in <coughs> trying to decide what you really need in your life, and it's not about denial; it's about pleasure as well, really. It's about the things that really um, matter in in the program of the home. So I wanted it to be sort of um, abstract but defined by really domestic, um, kind of banal domestic things. And they're the things which um, form the openings and give you either top light or side light. Um, the idea is that it, it can adapt. It, it's 
it's personalized prefabrication, but it's also <coughs> supposed to be light on its feet, you know? It's supposed to be okay to um, build it into a hillside. Maybe it's going to be in an urban context, maybe it's going to be in a flooding one, but it, it's got to... Um, it's got to be able to travel and, and go anywhere. I don't think it's um, about sitting it on the ground on kind of regular foundations. I think it's about um, small footings and having it poised above the terrain. I also think it's, it's got to respond to, um, in to climate change, not, not just in the sense of the uh, sustainability of the sources, of the materials that produce it, but um, it's about um, kind of embracing it and being more um, uh, more manifestation of climate change than trying to sort of counter it or um, work against it. I mean, it does its bit in the sense that the timber that makes it is, um, uh, you know, planting more than has been cut. In the case of the naked house um, of this design, there's. Um, eight trees go into um, the amount of timber you need to build this house, 104 metres. It's, um, it's a very simple plan. It's effectively three bedrooms where the um, dimensions are all Fibonacci, starting from the, the plank width of the um, KLH, really. I mean, there are one and twos around in the plan, but the three metre is the basic plank width, and that's those three metre cubes are the the two girls' bedrooms, they have their own um, private entry. So this kind of walking the plank entrance, which is that piece of the wall flipped down, that one brings you right into the living space. But they have their hot route, which will be useful later for boyfriends. And this is um, the bathroom that separates their world, that it's top light and oblique views, and windows defined by where the bed is folded down in two different ways. Um, their world is separated from, from ours, which has the ability to kind of close off and be a sort of slightly smaller apartment, part of the bigger one, but separable. So this is a um, kind of open-air room in the middle of the plan. It brings light right into the plan, as does this slot, but this is more of a, a terrace condition that's completely surrounded by glass. These are the sliding doors, which are identical to those. Uh, that's just one piece of glass, so you get the spectacular view that way. And this is a kind of uh, little study come extra guest facility. And yes, that is the ironing board. And that is um, things like the sofa and the table and so on, all of which are just, these are all the elements that are taken from the fabric of the, the building itself. There's the roof plan. That's the skylights for the um, bathroom. And here's how it is in elevation and section. And this took a lot of refinement. I think we did um, a great many versions of this before we decided it was right. Um, and then we had the great opportunity. I mean, uh, these refinements were carried out because we had the great opportunity, really, to exhibit the thing. And Norsk Form Gallery in Oslo said, no, they basically agreed to me saying we want to do a prototype timber house of the future kind of thing and they they said okay come on then and um, it was unbelievably difficult project because of the access and craneage and cost and difficulty and all the rest of it but what was really really fantastic was to just physically build it very very quickly over a couple of days the most of the structure was complete in a couple of days and then it was a bit of fitting out but it was a process that enabled us to really question our own detail and, uh, and learn from actually having to assemble it, which is something that architects don't often get to do. So that's the space. It was an electricity um, generating building for the Oslo tram network, now dysfunctional, so it's a very beautiful gallery of a kind of take modern sort of ambition, albeit for architecture and design rather than fine art. Um, there's the lorry arrived. I mean, the whole thing is about logistics. I mean, it's a fantastic process to go through in terms of learning. And there's the, one of the larger panels, roof panels going in. That's just how much weight I lost, you know, worrying about the whole thing. That's the um, sequence of assembly that 
I'll cut short. I've actually got a time lapse if you're interested. Um, I don't know if I've talked too long, but it's probably the best thing to... Um, shall I just dive into it? Is that a good idea? It's... Um, it's uh, just on the desktop. I just thought I'd play it so there's enough time. How... Not running. Running. So the industry asks the question, the exhibition industry asks the question um, whether um, whether new processes in architecture and in particular construction really um, surrounding really industrial processes could contribute to the development of architecture itself as in for example the way in which um, Le Corbusier's work was pushed along by his admiration for concrete technology and his admiration of say grain silos in the USA um, and my response was to to say that um, I thought the um, you know, as a potted history, it was reasonable to say that um, brick was the building material par excellence of, say, the 17th and 18th centuries in particular, obviously from Roman times until then, but they came into their own then, that was their era. So 18th century was brick, 19th century was steel, that was the era of the steel frame, all the great railway stations, all the fantastic exhibition structures, you know, Eiffel Tower and so on. 19th century was steel, 20th century was concrete. Um, and you know that you know that story, because that's received history in schools of architecture. And then 21st century, what's the material? And I have to say that's why I've made this definition, I think. 21st century will be the century of engineered timber. For the exhibition, we, we put the thing on um, recycled steel columns that Price and Myers, apart from all the other um, concerns about um, how to make the structure perform. I mean, it looks like a very simple box, which it is, but it's doing a lot of work with its um, deep beam facades and relatively large, relatively large spans. I mean, it's, it's an eight meter span from the long walls, which uh, the roof is helped along a bit by a spine wall internally of the children's bedrooms but I mean structurally all the walls are, are working and um, the floor is working probably hardest of all because it had a very irregular pattern of recycled columns which had to relate to the exhibition below I mean the story of the exhibition was that um, uh, Frank Barco was invited to do uh, to exhibit some uh, factory design work that he's done, um, which you might be familiar with. And the Norwegian practice, Helen and Hard, were asked um, to show um, their work for the um, town square in Stavanger, which is all about trying to make sense of the um, post-industrial problems of um, oil extraction from the North Sea. Um, so Sivelen from Helen and Hard said that they would do a landscape project and use the whole floor and cover it in, in various bits of recycled um, oil refinement stuff. And Frank Barco's response was to make a kind of canopy system that would um, be hung from the soffit. So he'd take the soffit, which kind of s left me saying, well, I'll take the airspace you know, in between them. And hence, the fact that the, this exhibit, um, all 22 tons of it, had to be three meters in the air, poised above um, a lot of steelwork exhibition. But I have to say, it was um, a fantastic experience educationally. And um, Jonas and I from the office 
worked um, pretty much around the clock with um, the KLH product and their specialist contractor um, in the form of Steve Coleman. And that was, um, I think, that's the kind of opportunity the ar that architects probably don't get. You know, they don't get it in school much. Increasingly here, I mean, I always built something at the end of the year here, and um, and that's still strong here. I'm pleased to see, especially Charles Walker's unit here. Um, but outside of that kind of rare experience within uh, organised, the organised crime of education, um, there's still um, relatively little opportunities for architects to um, physically build within their term of study before they go into practice. And um, we never take people on in the office who don't have a feeling for it. Um, you know, I, I'm very clear about um, uh, only wanting to work with people who know how much something um, weighs or know what it feels like or whether you can pick it up or not and what you could do with it. So, um, I'll finish. That's uh, the finished exhibit. I hope, it I hope it conveys in this rather crude um, form, this um, prototypical form, I hope it conveys the idea of um, uh, abstract domesticity. So thinking now about um, extrapolating, thinking about uh, how would you extend, how would people want to put the fantastic uh, living room on top of the uh, service rooms below, whether you could stack them, whether we could do mass housing with it. And uh, we're also thinking about the next steps for the use of this material. So um, I'll leave you now with... Uh, uh, yet another competition that didn't quite make it, which was also inspired by our factory visit and um, is a project that we will do, no doubt, one day. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. just have time to take a couple of questions if anybody has a question in the meantime um, I, I actually am quite interested in, in knowing having stayed away from the AA for I guess almost five years now um, do you find that there's a kind of um, different way of experimenting within the office that you took from the AA or kind of took from the unit and the experimentation that you did within the unit in a way mm -hmm. that that kind of manifests itself very differently or, I mean, some of these projects are so experimental that you could imagine them having happened in part of a kind of academic setting. So I'm just wondering if that sort of led to a different way of working within the office. Um, no. <laughs> 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 well, I think we always had it in us to work that way, but I think what the AA did do was um, let us not feel guilty about um, experiment. And um, I think there's a great deal of pressure in, in conventional practices to, um, to not really play and to not... Um, I mean, it could be conceived as spending inordinate amounts of time reaching um, a concept, but actually things feed off each other and other processes are very fast, so we, we, we go with it. And it's, um, it's the, the thing I, I remember actually from teaching is the um, honour of the process approach, which uh, the AA is very good at and always has been, and I guess um, that's what um, we took with us. Hmm. I mean, interesting, because I think in a way there are some units now that are not necessarily trying to do away with the process, but trying to arrive at hmm. a kind of product quicker, in a way trying to bring, hmm. I guess, some practices, yeah. or practice, practice back into a kind yeah. of academic setting. I guess... Uh, I was quite clear when running the unit that um, the students had to start with the material and um, that's about working in reverse really from the norm isn't it because <coughs> uh, the 
the uh, the automatic approach is to um, have a big scheme, massive infrastructure project, one to one thousand, and then at the end of the year you end up with the, the you know the uh, duty detail. And um, so I was keen to run it in reverse and make people get to know yeah. the material and then extrapolate. You know, is the Naked House coming to the UK? Yeah, it's here. It's here. It's arrived. It's in storage. It's going to be put up next year, hopefully. Yeah. I saw a hand raised in the back. Um, okay, I've got two there? questions. One is uh, it's related to the um, Kingston School. Um, Kingsdale, yeah. Kingsdale, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, you had, uh, the, I think the sports hall was entirely made of timber, is that right? So it's, mm. uh, it's not only the exterior, also the interior walls. No, the exterior is not. It it's overclad in um, thin steel. Um, mm. The question is, because well, in a sim similar situation, and did you did you find the contractors or, or the client that they were happy to to go with your proposal to make it entirely prefabricated, or was there a tendency to say, oh, okay, we do a steel frame and we overclad it with we had to etc. Yeah, for cost reasons mainly. Um, they weren't familiar with the system. Uh, hasn't been used in UK education before, at least not at this scale. I think um, a small classroom project um, was going in tandem with it and probably overtook it on site. But the, when we presented it, it was completely unknown. And uh, we went through the exercise of comparing it. So, um, you know, steel, frame, you know, look at it. I think. I think we costed it um, quite seriously in steel and timber in order to um, convince the local authority that we should go with it. Although, interestingly, they were very close. But the timber was more expensive, wasn't it? The timber at the time was slightly more expensive, but you um, made up for it because you didn't have to overclad it or infill it uh, to the extent that you would a uh, steel frame, especially internally. And we, we we were able to persuade the client on the basis of the inherent sustainability of it and the speed of erection and the durability of it. Actually, it was a much better option. And since then, the price of steel has rocketed and yeah. availability is difficult too. So we're, we're very smug about it. And for the Naked House, um, again, this is the exterior wall. So I say um, again? For the Naked House, the exterior wall. You um, for the exterior Naked House, um, that prototype will be rebuilt in the UK and it's going to be overclad in glass. Okay. So it'll be clad entirely in, in sheet single glass. Or double? Double. All right. Okay, so, so cost is not really the issue. Yeah, I, d I don't want to fill those perforations in with windows. Yeah. I want them to be perforations. And um, it obviously needs a waterproof exterior. So it'll be um, kind of wooden, wooden boat in a glass mm -hmm. bottle. Yeah wooden box in a glass bottle. Right, thank you. We have another question? Me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was interested, what, what's in the roof of the, of the house at the end, mm. what, what, what makes up the roof? And basically, the, given the panel, it's the span, and then mm. Um, well, there's a bit of insulation and then a bit of uh, membrane, and that's it. The panels, um, the panels run the eight meters between the long facades. They're they're dropped into place. Um, they're notch into the walls. The walls are housed with rebates so that the roof drops in. That was difficult on site. Um, lesson about tolerance is there, but the. Um, it did fit together very tightly and rigidly, and then you just put your insulation on top, laid to a slight fall, and there's a very large perimeter gutter. So there's a little upstand parapet wall. And then, um, yeah, we've, we're using a, a flag, it's a Dutch membrane, just a single, what single what plan what membrane. What kind, kind of panel dimension mm. makes that span of you? Should I go back to that yeah. crucial drawing? So, um, this is ironic because I asked Junko to take all the joints off the drawing, so <laughs> they would have been really useful. But um, looking at, um, that's the container obviously underneath. 
which has a supporting role, and then on the other side, here. Um, I wanted to use my special pointing stick, which um, it's a good time, I think, to, to get it out. It's uh, the perfect moment. Or maybe not. I'll, I'll keep looking for it. The um, yeah, column. I'd like no columns, obviously, but Price and Myers are um, advising me that I really should consider at least two along here. Um, those those panels, um, the floor panels, span that way. As do the roof. Um, the floor ones are really quite thick, and the roof thinner because um, there's an advantage of a bit of spine support here from this wall and these posts here at the corner of this glass box. So um, the, there's a roof panel which sits here and is cut and picked up there, and then there's another one that does that way, and they march off down the plan. They've always got at least two or three things to pick up the load. Um, these, these are the biggest panels. These are 13 meters by three, and they weigh like 1.2 tons each. But interestingly, they're not as heavy as the shorter but thicker roof panels, the heaviest of which was two tons. So it's n this is prefabrication, but it's not about lightweight. And that we were quite clear on that too at the beginning, because I think um, lightweight is... Um, is this, you know, lightweight is not satis satisfying to live in. It's, it's um, obviously a good way of moving buildings around and building them quickly, but I don't like that sort of caravan aesthetic, you know, the trailer home, the um, blow away in the gale. It doesn't f have the solidity of the concrete that we are replacing with this timber. And, you know, it's flat pack, so um, the lorry can take it. It's got to be on one lorry, I think. I think that's reasonable. I think if you're stretching to two lorries, then you're in the land of volumetric prefabrication where you've got to divide the house in two and have two lorries. <coughs> uh, this, this is all about one lorry, one container, one, um, you know, one load, one delivery, ho hopefully one day to erect it. I think if you're really on the ball with your programming, there's no, <coughs> no reason why you couldn't. It took us two, but we were inside a building. You know, it was just almost impossible to get the enough space to manoeuvre to do it. But I think if you're out in the open air on a reasonably open site, if that exists, then um, you could do it in a day. But that obviously that's just a primary structure. It's not the whole house in a day. You've then no, got, no doubt got years of fitting out, if that's your thing. In our terms, um, it won't be because um, you know we're not going to cover anything up. <coughs> internally, but hope to even have the floor as the same same system. We've allowed for perimeter um, perimeter uh, service trench so that everything is is down there. There's no light switches, no plugs, no um, different flooring with services underneath. None of that. Mm. The, the school has improved the kids' behaviour. Have you had any feedback? Apparently it has. Yeah. I always hesitate to make these categoric relations between um, design and behaviour, say. But it's true that the big main space has a very calming effect. I mean, clearly they're not 1,000 students being channeled down a 1.6 metre wide, 95 metre long corridor anymore because we've decanted all the circulation into the main space. So uh, I would say that you know the rather calm and cathedral-like quality of it does have a beneficial effect on behavior. But it's also, in other ways, interesting that it's inspirational. The light is in inspirational. It's always changing. Um, it's cool, you know. I think they come to school now. Um, no more reverse curriculum of bunking in for lunch, you know. They actually, school is a lot cooler and they come and grades have gone up but I always put the grades down to um, the fact that the staff don't leave now so the staff turnover has gone right down and um, that improves the education and the students come and 
it's cool enough to hang there, so they've got more of a chance of doing better. Yeah, it's in that g gap there. Look, can you see it? The little there. Yeah. Everything's routed in. Mm. Even um, even the TV. How much can you drive in for panels like Coming out the other side. Well, There's a lot of searching for the slimmest flat seam yeah. TV. I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, but it did it did work. The um, you know, it's uh, it depends. You know, it depends on your spans and, I mean this, I see it as not repeti repetitious prefabrication, I see it as a great opportunity for personalized prefabrication so that it, there's a basic design and there's options but you can vary it. But in this case, um, our walls were, um, Junko, was it 97 or was it uh, 120, I can't remember now. This crucial moment. Nin thank you, Carhind, mm. who supplied it. Yes, that's um, okay. So that's ninety-eight, and these are one hundred and forty-six, and two hundred and twenty-six for the floor. So these, uh, you can see how thick exact the wall is exactly here. These are the CD, um, these are, you know, dimension to for the CD boxes. Um, and, yeah, I mean, early ideas about them folding and being hinged and popping in and out, like the bed sort of popping into the wall. We soon got wise to that when we were building it. It's very heavy. So the relations are uh, are there, but they're more fixed than not, generally. Smaller ones can move. You can see we put the sofa on wheels. Um, but yeah, it's an unashamedly heavy product, and that's one of the reasons why I like it. Thank you very much, Alex. <laughs>